We are now talking to Seattle Mariners TV play-by-play broadcaster, Dave Sims. Dave, what's up, bud? Well, we're doing all right, guys. What's going on? How you doing? Well, I'm a little tired, man. I, I, I oh, stop, 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 it. stop, it. Yeah, stop I'm on it. it. Stop I'm on it. Team. You got first world problems. You got a radio show. You're complaining about being tired. Just stop. I'm tired, Dave. <laughs> Who I'm is tired. it? Hey, do 190 I, I, baseball games. I mean, I, nobody wants to hear that. I, Come on. Listen, listen. If, if if you gave me 119 uh, 90 baseball games and I was getting paid for it, I'd be yes. Give it to me. Give me those 190 baseball games. Dude, you're doing something that you love. Stop it. I know, Dave. I know. But I'm tired. I, I, w- I went to an event. I had to travel. I, had hey, to I said that one time to Tommy Lasorda during a Super Bowl week one time. And uh, the Giants' first Super Bowl. And this was before Radio Row really exploded. Yes. And I was out there in a drafty hallway. And Tommy came in. We invited him. And uh, I said, hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then some fans can walk him by. They were coming in from New York. And it snowed like crazy. And, hey, how you feeling? I said, yeah, a little bit run down. And, catch it. and Tommy Lasorda says, you got one of the best effing jobs in the world. You're good at it. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. Who's who said I'm good at what I do? You have You don't even know me yet, Dave. You don't even know me. You're already saying you said, I'm great. Yeah, you're clear. Where are you from? You you got to be. You're from somewhere on I-95 between Philly and New York, don't you? I'm Long Island, New York. Right, Long Dave. Island, same thing. Yeah, that's our thing. All right, no, I know. I'm a I'm a Philly, New York guy. I I I, I know a whole bunch of guys. You know, I, I, I dig the energy. Listen, I, I, I'm familiar I, with it. I have some energy, man. I do. I mean, so much energy. When I'm done with the show, I'm going to jump, not dive. I'm going to jump into bed with the covers on top of me. I'm just kidding. I got to take a shower first. Anyways. I would hope. Yeah, well, I hope too, man. I am sweaty and disgusting. Anyways, that's why I'm not wearing my shirt. I was wearing a sweater all day. I was sweating in this plate. It was horrible. Anyways, why don't we get into it? This offseason, it's been crazy. Some big moves. The Yankees added Juan Soto. What were your thoughts of the Yankees' acquisition of Juan Soto? Not hardly a shock. I mean, uh, he's a he's a Boris guy. Um, it's a good situation for him. And uh, the guy, he's one of the best hitters we have in the game. So, you know, given the history of the Yankees over the years, going after big names, uh, you know, big stars, hardly a surprise at all. So your division had a lot of uh, interesting storylines between the Texas Rangers winning the World Series, the Astros with everything they did in the offseason, and the Seattle Mariners, they give Julio Rodriguez that big contract. Uh, what are your thoughts to the rivalries that we've seen in this division that's come through? Uh, they're intense. I mean, the Mariners missed by one stinking game last year. They were heartbroken to see uh, Texas and, and Houston badly for the American League pennant <laughs> and knowing that they, they they more than held their own against those two teams last year. And, you know, this year they made some moves. They got rid of some guys who did a lot of striking out, Teoscar Hernandez and, and uh, Eugenio Suarez and Jared Kelnick, three really good dudes. But uh, it's all about pro- productivity. And uh, I think this year's team is a lot more balanced, deep, and that it has more guys that will put the ball in play to go along with the terrific pitching staff. We are talking to Seattle Mariners TV play-by-play broadcaster Dave Sims. Dave, Julio Rodriguez is one of the best power hitters in baseball, one of the best young players in baseball. Tell us a little bit about watching him in 162 games in a season. He is a fantastic talent. What type of player is he? Well, he's a combination of power speed, 6'3", 235. He can run. He covers gap-to-gap in the outfield. Plays with tremendous enthusiasm, hits the ball hard. Uh, you know, when he's going good, you know, he learned a lot uh, out of his uh, coming out of his se- September slump after s- just a magnificent August last year when the club won uh, 21 games, a club record. And he is uh, fully committed this year. He uh, he missed the first few games of, of spring training because uh, they had a little hand problem with the left hand. I think a lot of it was from over overwork and being so hungry. Uh, to get ready for the season, he's going to be fine. I know, you know, he is. I always say that he plays with the joy of amazing on Clemente, and he's just, he's bigger than both of them oh, in, in terms of physicality. I mean, he's a big physical kid and good throwing arm, great baseball sense. He makes a mistake, you rarely see it made again. He's a real deal. So you uh, in the being in the AL West, you got to broadcast the Mariners against the Angels a lot with Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani wins two of the last three years MVP, and then gets the big contract in the offseason. What is it like broadcasting him as a as a two way player? 
uh, you know, it, it, it's a treat. And uh, you know, we'll see him uh, in August when we play at the Dodgers. Uh, he is a memorable player, to put it mildly. I mean, when he's pitching, you know, he's throwing 100 with a 6-6 six, six splitter and slider. And then he can hit the ball 400 feet. So it's a real treat to watch him. And I feel badly for people on the East Coast to, uh, you know, if you don't, if you want to stay up late and watch, it's worth it. But, you know, a lot of people, just like each row was back in the day, it's just the name and, and maybe some highlights you see on Sports Center or MLB. But he is a dynamic player. And if he, can, if he can stay healthy, you know, he's coming, obviously, he's not going to pitch this year, but he has the potential to put up just stupid numbers. So, um, and, and here's the other thing, too, that we don't talk about a lot. He's as fast a runner as we have in baseball. I mean, he's a he's a beautiful runner. I remember asking his uh, interpreter, I said, did he run the 400 meters in high school? He said, he said he never did, but, you know, he runs, he's so, he just eats up so much real estate when he runs. He's got the great lean when he comes around second base. I mean, he looks like he's been doing this professionally, you know, just as a runner. He's that good an athlete. You know, it's so interesting. We we, we look at Che Otani, we look at the Dodgers, and, and the Dodgers uh, like to spend money, as we all know. They pay Mookie bets. They they went after Freeman. Now they bring in Yamamoto and Otani, this deferred money. Now you're hearing Freeman has deferred money. You have Mookie bets who has deferred money. You have Otani, Yamamoto. I mean, what is up with this deferred money? It's been around baseball for a long time, and now I guess the Dodgers have perfected it. Do you like this situation right now that baseball has when it comes to this deferred money situation? Hey, Tom Brady did it over in the NFL for a lot of years. A lot of guys are doing it. Mahomes just did it in the NFL. Smart way to help your ball club and keep some money available. Uh, it, it, certain, the way the Dodgers operate, it seems like they have a bottomless pit in terms of money, and they do have some group, uh, that Guggenheim uh, partnership is really spectacular. There's no question about it. They're super aggressive, and they get after it, and you know they're in a, they're in a major market. So. I, I might be for about it. It's, it's they're not breaking any rules, and that's you know, rules allow that to happen, and, and they take advantage of it. I, I don't see anything to get upset over. It's you know, and they're not going to have a cap and uh, salary cap in baseball, so they're big boys, just like when the Yankees were rolling, uh, you know, during their, during their runs over the last 35, 40 years. So uh, MLB this year went through a lot of rule changes, a lot of uh, hitters, pitchers, the pitch clock with that. And you've been broadcasting in baseball since 1993. For one thing, how is it an adjustment for you as a broadcaster? And what are your thoughts on some of the new rules? Well, the, the pace is really good. And uh, yeah, there's no filling, or a lot less filling time because uh, guys aren't walking around the mound and not walking around in the batter's box. You know, they're not scratching this side, scratching that side. Oh, what am I going to do? Play, you know, it's an entertainment media, entertainment a game, entertaining game. Play it. You want to see the ball in action, the ball in play. And uh, I like the fact that they widen the first base uh, uh, base path. I thought that was great. Give uh, you know, and let's cut down on, on injuries. The other rule that was already in effect, but they're going to enforce it. You know, second baseman, third baseman, they cannot you know put a leg, put a knee down, and block access to the bag. That's a good rule. They're going to get, get called on that this year. Uh, and that's, you know, the follow up from a few years ago from the, the Posey where we can't blow up the catches anymore. So, and it took a couple of seconds off the uh, pitch clock. Nothing wrong with that. Let's go. Put the ball in play. Move it. Let's go. Move it along. <laughs> we are talking to Seattle Mariners TV play by play broadcaster Dave Sims. First time on the show of the Loudmouth. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we talk about all these different rules and, and, and all the money that the MLB is bringing in with all these endorsements and all this. When you look at the steroid era, and we've had a lot of players come on this show, ex-players and players have brought up, and we brought up the steroid situation and guys like Barry Bonds who made tons and tons of money and Roger Clemens and – Manny Ramirez and even David Ortiz, who was caught, who's still in the Hall of Fame. Do you believe, as an as a broadcaster, you've been in the game for such a long time, that these guys should still be in the Hall of Fame? Boy, you, there has not been conclusive evidence about uh, Barry and Roger, but certainly everybody suspects it. You know, the numbers warranted. I, you know, part of me wishes Pete Rose was, was in the Hall of Fame, but he clearly broke a rule that was a standard. It was right there out in front of you. Dude, you can't bet on gambling. Even if you bet for your own team, you can't do it. You're not supposed to do it. You can't do it. And then with the, with the steroid guys, 
you know, I, I don't think it was anything was proven. Certainly there was a lot of uh, question about when uh, Big Poppy he got banged. I don't know the whole backstory there, but it's easy to, easy to suspect that Bonds and Clemens did it. So I understand why they're not getting it. But at the same time, when you think about it, you can debate this until the cows come home two or three times. I mean, it was an illegal substance, and it, it was all about recovery. It didn't make Barry Bonds a better hitter. It didn't make uh, Clemens a better pitcher. It was all about how quickly you can recover. And, and tee it up again. That's what it was all about. And that gave a distinct advantage to them. And I know I've spoken to guys uh, who are angry with a few other guys who did make the Hall of Fame, who are suspected have, of having used PEDs and said, hey, man, he took money out of my pocket and a few other cats' pockets. So this, um, this is going to be a debate that's going to last till the end of time. So uh, one of the other uh, one of the other Hall of Famers that got inducted this year was with the Seattle Mariners briefly, Adrian Beltre. Then he got into play in Texas, so you got to see him for a while. Uh, what was it like watching him play? And have you had any interactions with him off the field? I liked him a lot. I, I, as strong a character dude as you ever want to meet, physically and mentally tough as anybody I've ever been around in all the sports I've covered. A great third baseman made that bear that. Uh, charge you a slow roller up the third baseline, bare hand, throw off balance. He made that play night in, night out, and the throws were always on the money. He never, he never hung his first baseman out to dry. He started the, he started double plays. I mean, his range was outstanding. And it was always a blast after, you know, he had been here with us in Seattle. And then when he was with Texas, it was always a treat because he and Felix, with Felix Hernandez was going to be pitching. Something funny was going to happen at some point. And there's some great video out there where one time uh, Felix struck him out on a, just a phenomenal breaking ball. That And clearly, Beltre was sitting on a, on a fastball. And he looked bad. And, and Felix, it's amazing he was able to pitch to the next guy because he was laughing so hard. And, and to see uh, Beltre come back last year when Felix went into the Mariners Hall of Fame, it was, a, it was a big surprise for Felix. It was an emotional moment for everybody. It was beautiful. It was great. He's a, he's a first-class dude. He really is. Speaking of Felix Hernandez, the king, there's only three players in sports history that value the king name. Felix Hernandez, Henrik Lundqvist, and LeBron James. And I Arnold believe... Arnold Palmer, that's four. They can Arnold Palmer. All right, Arnold Palmer. <laughs> I forgot him. Okay, Arnold Palmer, the king. But uh, of four guys. And Felix Hernandez, really, for like a five-year, six, six-year span, he was the best pitcher in baseball. It's not even close. Yep. He right. was a guy that I absolutely loved. I, I hated the Seattle Mariners because I grew up a Yankee <laughs> fan. And the Mariners in the 90s, it was back. 95, I know. It still hurts, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It very much does. <laughs> Don't even bring it up. Please, stop it, Dave. Stop it. I'm tired, Dave. You're hurting my feelings now. But uh, I they, they've always I, – I remember Buner and all those other guys, uh, Ken, Ken, Ken Griffey and every single player, Edwin – I mean, everybody, I, I hated that Mariners team, but, and Randy Johnson, but there was something about Felix Hernandez that I, I loved. And when he went on the mound, you knew you were going to see something special. What type of pitcher was he? I mean, calling his games, what type of player is he now? A person he is he now off the field as just a, you know, another, you know, just a, a civilian. Well, he, he's, you know, he, he's got his, his own life going on down in Miami. I'm told, but I tell you what, when he was pitching here, we, <laughs> I think we had a radio segment where hey, Felix is pitching and they play the Leslie Gore song, Sunshines and Lolly, Sun, Sunshine, Lolly, Pops and Roses, uh, because there, there were some bad clubs he was on. And it was like the Phillies back in 72 and Carlton won 27 of the 59 games or whatever it was. And he was winning up, you know, disproportionate percentage of, of the games. But it was a treat. Every fourth, fifth day, you knew you are going to have a very good chance to win. And, and when he had the fastball to go along with this, just the stupid changeup and the slider, it was great. And then the last couple of years, he was able to get away with the slide, uh, the uh, changeup. This is off-speed pitch. Uh, it was always exciting. The crowds always ticked up a few thousand more when he was pitching at home. And, you know, the opponents knew that they were in for a long, you know, a long couple, three hours uh, when he was on the mound. Dude was – and you're right. Those uh, four or five year stretch, he was he was tremendous. He won one Cy Young, and I thought he should have won a second for sure. I, I remember when he won that Cy Young. I, I think he had a losing record. And he, well, yeah, no, I think it was something like twelve. He won like twelve or thirteen games, but the the uh, the analytics were overwhelming in well, his favor. Right. 
Uh-huh. And and that's what got him the Cy. I mean, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s where, you know, if you won a Cy Young Award, generally you probably got 20 or more wins. And, um, but that fact that he did it with 12, 13, I think it was 13 and 3 or something like that. He had a bunch of no decisions. He had yeah, some it was in back-to-back under- years, there's, too. There's, there. only, there's only two players that have done it with losing records, winning a Cy Young. Jacob DeGrom and Felix Hernandez in the last 25 years. Like I said, that was he didn't have a losing record now. He had a, he had a low win total. That wasn't a losing record. I think, well, you sure it wasn't a losing I thought it was a losing record. I, I believe me. Hey, I, I worked think may, maybe it was Zach Greinke. Greinke might have had it. I know Felix he had, had one more. Felix didn't have a whole bunch of wins, but, you know, again, the analytics told the story. and He, he dominated in those categories, and that's what kicked it over the top. Yeah, because I think he, he was – he was he was unbelievable, and his prime. I mean, I mean it was not bad. Yeah, because I think Zach Grinky the year before Hernandez won won the Cy Young, and he had like a ten and eleven record. Maybe or it was like him. That. Maybe it was him. Um, Maybe yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't the Cy Young. No, Felix, it's, uh, the year he wins the Cy. There you go. Thirteen and twelve. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think the only other pitchers, Zach Grinke and Jacob DeGrom, when he won his first one with the Mets in 2018, were the only ones that had like 10 wins or less with, yeah. with, a, with a losing record, mm-hmm. with a uh, Cy Young Award. Year. That's who I meant. It was yeah, probably and, Grinke. And, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, Grinke, 16 and, uh, 16 and 8 with a 216. All right, maybe it was a different in year. Tw- in 2009. Okay. My, yeah, maybe it was he, a different uh, year then. Yeah, it had to have been because, uh, and that's his only Cy. I know there were two pitchers uh, in the last 25, 30 years that have had losing records that have won Cy Youngs. And I, I, I thought I thought it was Felix Hernandez, but I'm wrong. And then we thought Ooh, it was Grinke. No, no, no. So, all right, go ahead. All right, so while we re- research who those were, uh, I want to ask about the uh, cultural <laughs> impact on and off the field of Ichiro uh, when he was with the Mariners. Uh, it was a, a city that almost uh, lost the team. They were saying the kingdom was being uh, torn down or whatever it was. And Ichiro and that, like you're saying, Griffey, those guys were vitalized the team. So what was the impact of that in the city of Seattle? Well, I got here in 07, so Itch was at the uh, – he was probably at the three-quarter pole on his, on his career. Still very effective. Played the hell out of right field. Played center field for I think part of one year. Um, great, unbelievable eye hand contr- uh, coordination. I remember he beat Mariano Rivera with a walk off at our place. Mm-hmm. Can't remember the year, but it was a dynamic moment. Mo had been you know just killing everybody, and, and I remember you know I think of my my call. I said, "Hey, couple of all the favors going head to head here," and each of hit a bullet into the lower right field stands to win the game. It was a walk off. Uh, great player. Um, I know some of the, you know, it's interesting. Some of the guys that had played with him be, uh, before I got there at seven, uh, they weren't big fans of him. They thought he was selfish. They wish he had hit, uh, you know, if you'd watch him in batting practice, he, he could hit, he would go uh, in that last round of BP, he could hit the ball in the upper deck, in the third deck, and everything. But he wanted to get his base hits, get on base, maybe steal, go first to third. I'm not arguing with his career at all. His first ballot Hall of Fame. He goes in next year. I don't think there's any question about that. Great player and you know, sort of a man of mystery. And I'll tell you this, his impact when we were over in Japan in 19, you know, it's like growing up, I had seen there's a, what do you call it, newsreels of uh, people crying at the mere sight of Elvis or the Beatles during that time. If there were men, especially if there were men and women crying at the mere sight of Ichiro when when he took the field last uh, in, in nineteen, and then he played his last game at, over in Japan, and it was a long wait. He was in the clubhouse saying goodbye to his, uh, his teammates, and then he came out, and like most of the fifty thousand people were still in the ballpark, and they went absolutely nuts. <laughs> and that's how big he is. I mean, even now, and he's still down here in spring training. I see him pretty much every day shagging. Uh, I didn't take BP, but you know he and uh, he and Julio have become you know good buddies over the last couple of three years. And then when we get back to Seattle for home games, we'll see him, and he'll be at me out there shagging. You know, I, I get to the ballpark at two two thirty, he's out, you know, working on his arm throwing. He's like fifty years old, still in unbelievable shape. I think, believe me, if he could still hit, he would still be playing. And by the way, it was Eric Gagne. It was okay, Eric Gagne and Jacob Degrom. There Eric Gagne go. was two and three. Relief pitcher, uh, he was two and three. He won the Cy Young, and it was Jacob Degrom. So those are the two guys. Wave it to the Mets. I'm not giving them any run support all year. <laughs> hey, it's that way. Lack of run support. I mean, Felix has some uh, some yeah. whacked out mark about you know 
going six innings or more with uh, giving up, you know, four or fewer hits, two or fewer runs, and coming away with no decisions. I mean, there's no decision, Mark. I mean, and I, I only missed the first, let's see, he, he, he came, I got here in seven. He was a full-time starter by then, so I think I missed mm-hmm. a couple of years. But he lost, I, since I've been here, he must have lost at least 30 games where, you know, you know he should have gotten a, a winning decision, but he had some bad offensive ball clubs. Yeah. We are talking to Seattle Mariners TV play-by-play broadcaster Dave Sims. Tell us a little bit what you know about Ichiro Suzuki. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I I loved Ichiro Suzuki. I love watching him every year, 200 hits. It didn't matter what year it was, how many games he missed, which wasn't a lot. But when he did, he still hit over 200, 200 hits. Uh, the guy was unbelievable. He He missed like five years of his major league career, six years of his major league career playing in Japan, and he still hit over 3,000 hits. He probably would have had the – I think he would have had Pete Rose's record if he played five, six years before that. What are your thoughts to Ichiro that's, Suzuki? Tell us a little bit about that, what you know about him. That's fair. I mean, I, I, you know, he's a guy that could hit a two-hopper to shortstop and make it a close play. Um, you know, he's a guy I didn't do a whole lot of interaction with him, but he was a he was a big piece of what was happening here in Seattle. I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here. I got chapter and verse stories on the guy, but a great player. I mean, the numbers and the video that you've seen, and how about the fact when he went to New York when he, traded for the Yankees and went down to Miami. He impacted on both of those clubs and they loved them in those two places. And I know a lot of guys, a lot of guys I know in New York said, man, I wish, you know, we had had this guy in his prime. Imagine how big he had been had he been a Yankee in his prime, not getting, you know, getting all those hits, all those, you know. His hitting year. wasn't even the best attribute that he had. It was his defense in the way he threw the ball in the outfield. He had the best arm uh, in baseball. Right. It was, it was one of the great throwing arms. I mean, it was Clemente-esque. You know, uh, you think of great right fielders with the cannons out there. Got Ichiro, uh, Dave Winfield, Clemente, uh, what was it, Ellis Valentine, um, Dave Parker. That's what Dave Parker. A lot of dudes, another- man. Uh, and Daryl Evans. Daryl Evans had a Vladimir good Guerrero. Vlad- oh, wow. Excellent. Fabulous. I mean, he can bring it. He can bring it. It's a good one. Great. A good, great. Oh, I loved watching Vladimir. He hated the Yankees, and he didn't want to play for the Yankees. <laughs> for some reason, he couldn't stand the Yankees. But and either did Ken Griffey Jr. By the way, so he Junior, didn't you know, Junior would have, you know, Junior said, "I don't have all the stories, but but uh, when his dad was playing with the Yankees and Billy Martin gave him a hard time, uh, he was let he would let uh, the kids, the sons of some of the other players, mainly anyway, white players." do X, Y, Z and hang out in the clubhouse. And he would always be on junior. Junior never, never forgot it. Said, I'd never, I'll never play for the Yankees. It's not going to happen. And I don't know what his numbers are off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure the numbers that, that he put up at Yankee Stadium are off the chart. I think they said, I think he said he would have retired like before he was 30, before going to the Yankees. <laughs> that's, that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. He killed yeah. the Yankees. He always killed the Yankees. Every single time he killed the Yankees, I hated it. You ever see the movie Little Big League? He's in it. I've seen the trailers. I didn't watch it, but yeah, yes, yeah. he was. He and a whole bunch of dudes were in that thing. Yes, 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 they were. Dave Magadan, I think, was in it. I, if I'm not I like mistaken. him. Yeah, I got the, Max. Max, good guy. I haven't seen Max in a while, but he, he's one of my favorite dudes. Yeah, so I, I remember the movie. It, it's so funny. Uh, Carlos Bayerker is in the movie. So it, it, and he was he was also a good player. He played for he he had some good years, man. He could swing it when the he was 90, on the Indians. When he was in the mid Mets. to late <laughs> mid to late nineties uh, Indians clubs. Uh, it's a bit, you know they made it to what two World Series. They didn't win them, but boy, they had some. They could hit Jim Tomey and that crew. You saw a lot of great players. You've seen a lot of good teams on that Seattle Mariners uh, your squad. You just never saw a championship. That's a, that's yeah, a I mean, two years ago, where are we? The 20th, 20th, 22 season, we made the playoffs upset yep. Toronto in Toronto mm-hmm. and then scared the daylights out of Houston. And, you know, Dusty Baker tells me even to this day, he says, hey, man, we're more afraid of you guys than anybody we knew that we could be playing and you know, moving forward in the playoffs. And, you know, it took a eight, they had to beat us, what, one nothing, 18 inning game, game three of that series. Payne had a home run uh, to win it. And right, we had the first game won, but Robbie Ray gave up an, a moonshot to uh, Jordan Alvarez, and that, that mm-hmm. turned the tide of the whole game because uh, Mariners had done a great job on Verlander, who had really shoved it on them for the most of the year. 
and they got him out of there in about the fifth inning or so. It really roughed him up, and then Houston just kept packing away, packing away. We, Mariners never really scored again, and, and that's why it came down to uh, you know Alvarez hitting that big home run late in the game. You mentioned Dusty Baker. Tell us, do you have a story about Dusty Baker that you you could remember that's just so he, funny? He, he is one of the the coolest guys in the history of Major League Baseball. He freaking knows everybody. And if you go back and look at his, uh, uh, let's see, it was his news conference when he got the uh, Nationals job. And I forget how the question came up, but I think it was about, hey, man, you know a lot of people. He said, yeah, well, you know, it's, you know, and he was ra basically raised in baseball by Hank Aaron. But the story that I, I remember hearing him when I listened to that news conference was talking about how he was in San Francisco and he was in Haight Ashbury and he looked, he was walking with some of the guys going to get something to eat. And he looked across the street and there was, there was Jimi Hendrix. He said, yo, Jimmy. And he ran across the street and they became pals and they went off and uh, had a little token going on. Um, and then the other, the other story that comes to mind is, um, Few years ago, as you probably realize, there's not a hell of a lot of uh, African Americans playing Major League Baseball these days. The mm -hmm. numbers way down, fewer than what is it? We're in the seven, eight percent out of the what twelve hundred guys or whatever it is. But one year, um, I want to say 2011, 2012, he was with Cincinnati and he had you know that home rented over in Scottsdale, and uh, he had he invited all the black and Latino uh, retired players, scouts, media, anybody else that want to come. They had a big old house. And I'm telling you, it was amazing dudes who showed up because, you know, like Dusty Baker says, hey, come on down to the, to the crib. And it was amazing. And I wished it would have been a great intrusion, but I wish we at the very least could have had a whole bunch of still pictures of the cats who were there. And you know, recently retired guys were scouting and uh, it was just tremendous. It was one of the best moments I've ever had in sports, you know, especially considering, you know, not having to do with the broadcast or having to write anything. Cause, you know, I used to be a writer at, sport, at uh, the Daily News in New York. Um, he, he's just a cool dude. And when he won the World Series a couple of years ago, I called him. I waited a couple, three weeks. I said, all right, I know you probably heard from everybody. I said, I said give me an idea who, uh, who you've heard from. He says, well, some guy named Obama. And then uh, he started naming like LeBron. I mean, a who's who uh, of, of cats in in the world of sports and out of sports. The thing, that, one of the things that made him so great is that if he knew your hometown and they were going into your hometown, or like this, some Hispanic guys, or he would he would set up a, a meal or grab some takeout from a, a restaurant, a noted restaurant in that town, or he would you know he he if he knew birthdays. He would do a special thing in the clubhouse. I mean, managers, there's a lot of managers, they do you know pretty cool things like that, but I just, not just they probably broke the mold, you know. You know, when must when Dusty came here, man. He's 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 going to the Hall of Fame and I'm thrilled for him that he got the World Series, even even though it was at our expense. But he's going to the Hall of Fame. I think the last time I looked, he was I think he's seventh all time in wins. And he's and he's just he, he's a great person and you can't matter of fact the other day who did we get we got ryan stanick uh who had been with them who's a free agent you know, he's a really valued addition to uh mariners bullpen he couldn't say enough good things about this and he I, said I, dusty I, dusty was he said dusty was dusty now works for the giants and stanick said hey man dusty was trying to get me get the giants to take uh to, to bring me in but i said well i'm glad you're here and that's gonna work out <laughs> Well, I love Dusty. He's one of my favorites. I wish he was. I wish he managed the Yankees at one point of his career, but it was like the only team he's never managed. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to manage here in Seattle back when when Lou Lou uh, Pinella, when that whole thing fell apart. He was hoping that he'd have got the job then. He loves hunting and fishing. Loves this area, the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't work out. Well, I love I love the toothpick a uh, toothpick. <laughs> That's the best part of every time I see him on the on the bench, it's like, where's that toothpick? And he's flipping it in his mouth. Yeah. I've never seen him get it caught in his teeth. It, it's unbelievable. This guy's yeah. flipping it and flipping it and flipping. I'm like, this yeah. guy is he and uh, UL Washington, who just passed away a couple of days ago, great infielder with the Kansas City Royals back in the late '70s, early '80s, was the same thing. He, he played with it. It's like it's amazing that he never had an accident. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I, it's unbelievable. I watch it every time I watched uh, Houston or the Giants. I always watched him in the dugout. He's he's standing. He's holding onto the bar and he's flipping this thing in his mouth. I'm like, do, does it ever get caught in his teeth? I mean, nah, seriously, nah. it's a crap. Like, and, and you know the other thing too that's really great. There's so many things we've talked about Dusty for a long time, but you know he he learned as a 20 year old. Uh, you know Henry Aaron was still the king down in Atlanta. And he was like a second father to Dusty. And, and he said, hey, man, he taught a lot of us, particularly the black guys on the team, you know, how to dress, how to, you know, and we were young kids, we didn't know anything. He says, you know, how to go to a fine restaurant, table settings, how to get the best clothes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Cito Gaston tells stories about it. I mean, Ralph Gar. I mean, the guy, the, the guy's a Hall of Fame human being, let alone the fact that he's going to get, you know, all the people. I wish, you know, He's no kid anymore. I mean, he's still vibrant as all heck. It's 73 4. But it's one of those situations where you want to take that five five year rule and say, hey, man, no, 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 no. Here's an exception to the rule. Here's your plaque. Come to Cooperstown. We'll see you in July. See, Dusty, you see what the thing with Dusty is, I think he'd still be managing and re- wheeling his wheelchair in the dugout if he, if he could. <laughs> You see, Dusty is like with, instead of you know with a toothpick in his mouth, he'll have like he'll have like the, like these holes in his wheels where he can pull out a toothpick and stick it in his mouth and just spin it around. I call them wheels. We'll call it Dusty Wheels. Let, let Dusty man from the, let Dusty man from the bullpen cart. Yeah, why not? Why not? Stranger things, right? Eh? Oh, it's, it's, Dusty probably would do it, but uh, we really appreciate the time as always. I know you're a busy guy. You're getting ready for the baseball season, and we're looking forward to watching you and, and listening to your broadcasts, and uh, hopefully we get you on very, very soon, my friend. Hey, good to meet you guys. Uh, where, where in Long Island are you from? I'm actually – we're from Suffolk County. He's from Connecticut, actually. Speedy's from Connecticut. We're in Connecticut. Uh, I'm I'm from uh, Reading, Connecticut. It's right uh, right near Fairfield, Bridgeport. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, That's, and yeah, everybody um, lives up there. I yeah. moved I moved down here uh, with extended family because my extended family, uh, my my grandparents all grew up here. So I moved here in 2017 to work with uh, this network, and I've been here ever since. So you guys, you work at, you work out of uh, you work out of the city, the the, the great Long New York City. You're Long from your home. All right, good for you, man. Long Island, we we work on 103.9. We have a show on 103.9 too. So, yeah, oh, right I, on. I, good for you. Yeah, I go. I've, I traveled to the city for this event today. It was like a broadcast event with all these big names, these big, you know, notch guys, and and Stephen A. Smith was there and he was speaking. So, and I'm and I'm not a big Stephen A. Smith fan, but I I would say he was fantastic today. It I'm was sure he was fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm fantastic sure he was. <laughs> Oh, I heard okay. you guys talking about. I heard you talking about before you came on about him. Maybe if Kimmel, if and when Kimmel yeah. retires, he wanted that gig. He would yes. take that gig. Yes. Oh Lord. <laughs> okay. He did say it. I, I, I. He did say it. It. Somebody asked him. and said if Kimmy Jimmy Kimmel came out and said uh, the other day that he might be retiring next year. If if ABC offered you the job, would you take it? And you see Stephen, you know, look down. You know, he's like he puts his shoulders up and he's like, "Of course, I would take it." <laughs> he's a piece of work he's a good one all right boys hey be well i'll talk Dave, to you guys we'll see you soon right? man you bet absolutely man. Right, be good take care